All right, fellow geography students, this is Mrs. Wildy. Um, we're going to continue our look at, at the introduction to geography. This is part two a Geographer's Tools. You should be taking notes as you watch and listen. Um, I will also have a few sort of quiz you along the way questions, and we'll go through those. Um, I do expect you to come into class with any questions that you have over this material. If you don't understand why the answer is what it is, or if you don't, if you need a little more detail about a certain idea, we'll of course be practicing some of these skills in class. But if there's something else that we don't cover and you still have a question about it, please, please feel comfortable comfortable coming to me. All right, so part two of three parts. Um, first question, and a lot of this this um, section of the introduction is, is actually vocabulary. So what is cartography? Cartography is just the, the, the map making. It is the science of making maps. So um, we will certainly be making plenty of maps within this, within this course and certainly this unit. Uh, so be prepared for that. The problems that occur are that oftentimes we're, we're dealing with the map of the world, but the world is, the earth is spherical. It is um, large, um, and a, a map would be a very flat piece of paper and small. You want to be able to see it so and, and work with it. So we're going to deal, deal with that problem in, in several different ways, and I'll get to that in just a second. Um, another another a way, one way that we do this is through map scale, and that just means that we take, uh, we make a, a feature size on a map, um, and tell the viewer, the reader of the map, what that relates to in actuality on the Earth. So, for example, it can be done in several different ways. You might have a ratio, like on the map, it's, it, you know, one size on the map equals 24,000 um, size in reality. Or you may have a fraction like 1 to 100. Um, oftentimes you'll have the line, I know you're familiar with this, where you have an inch or you have, you know, 10 centimeters or whatever the line distance is, it tells you what that equals in miles or kilometers or the actual distance of, on the earth. Or you may have it written out without a line where it just says one inch equals one mile or whatever. Um, this is a big deal understanding scale. So if you're really confused, we're going to do some activities that practice this. Um, but I want you to really be sure you understand what that means. And again, it has to do with the fact that if you were looking at it on the actual Earth's surface, it's going to be far larger than it will be on a piece of paper. And a piece of paper is also flat. So here's a little quiz question. Do your best, and I'll, I'll go through it in just a second. Which would be a good scale to view a classroom, a school, a parish? A parish is like a county. You can think of it kind of like Gwinnett County as a parish. Or a country. So um, hopefully you've had enough, enough of a chance to kind of think about this. Um, I think that for a classroom, you would have letter D, one inch equals 10 feet. For a school, it might be letter E, one inch equals 100 feet. A parish or county would be C, one inch equals 100 miles. And a country would be the, the A, one inch equals 1,000 miles. I don't know why there's no B on here. I just realized that. But <clears throat> anyway, with the letters given, that's what I would give. So another issue within, um, within making maps is resolution. So resolution is the, the smallest discernible unit you can put on the map based on the scale. So for example, if you have, um, let's go back for a second, if you have your, your scale for the country of 1 inch equals 1,000 miles, you're going to have a very, that's a large scale map, right? However, there's going to be very little resolution. You're not going to have a lot of detail on that map because it's showing so much distance. Whereas a map of the classroom, one inch equals you know, 10 feet, is going to be able to show lots more detail on it. That would be a high resolution map. So hopefully that makes a little more sense. Projection. Again, um, well, once again, we've got location on the Earth's surface versus on a flat map. You're going to have to distort some things. And so we have lots of different types of projection maps that have distorted in some way either the size, the shape, or the distance of what it is in actuality on the Earth versus what it is on the map. So I'm going to show you a couple, actually a few different geographers take on this and how they've distorted the Earth's surface um, in, ter in terms of putting it on a map. So the, one of the most famous ones is the Mercator projection. 
This sort of distorts both size and shape, um, but it's oftentimes used for nautical purposes, and you, you will oftentimes see this actually on the AP exam. Sometimes they will give you a, a map and ask you for what type of projection it is. So you're going to have, again, the reason it's used for nautical purposes is you have a lot of water being shown on this map. Okay, so the oceans really are demonstrated here. Um, and so it, it's, it, it is um, oftentimes used for that purpose, and we talk about it quite a bit in class as well. The mall weed projection distorts shape and angle. And so you're going to um, have an accurate representation of the area, but your shape's a little bit distorted for that. So that's mallweed. Robinson is also a fairly famous one, and this distorts everything but in just a little bit. So it's size, shape, and distance distorted. But it seems to be one that people sort of, they like the look of the Robinson projection quite a bit. It's visually appealing. So you'll see this oftentimes. Um, this one is a, is a little bit different. This is an azimuthal equidistant projection, so it's distorting the distance, of course, just equal distance, and shape. Um, so the, the further out from the center you get, the more distortion you're going to have. Um, oftentimes this is showing the polar region, of course, like so you're going to you're going to be looking, it's as if you're looking down over um, the top or the bottom of the map. Um, fuller projection is definitely a strange one. It's going to change the action. It's going to maintain the shape, but it changes the location or the direction at which it is. So again, this, if you were looking at this one, this is North America, this is South America. It's changing the location of the continents, um, but the shape is, is maintained. So that's fuller. And then Peters distorts um, the shape. Um, but it's giving you the actual, the accurate size. It's a little bit different. So this is um, politically driven maps or, or ones that are going to really focus on sort of countries might be um, um, the Peters projection. So here's a little quiz based on what we just talked about. Um, some of these are very easy because we've already, we, it's the actual picture you were given. A is different, but see if you can kind of figure out which one it looks most closely to. So um, your choices again are Peters, Fuller, Azimuthal Equidistant, Robinson, Mallweed, and Mercator. So A, hopefully you said Mallweed. B is Mercator, C is the Azimuthal Equidistant, and D is Robinson. All right, so different types of maps. This is a big deal in geography, of course, and you're going to use different maps for different purposes. So the first map we're going to talk about is a reference map. Reference map shows locations of places and geographic features. So you may have um, um, a map that is... Um, just showing the states of the United States. That's a reference map. It may be that it's showing the climates. That's a reference map. Um, it's usually one or two different ideas, but it, you're, you refer to it to look up something. Um, oftentimes these have relative location, and we're gonna, we talked about this with, you, with, with the first part of the introduction, but we'll go through it again. So relative location is where something is in relation to other features. So for example, um, obviously, this teacher teaches in Louisiana. They really like Louisiana. But um, where is Cato Parish in, in relation to other things? So um, here is Cato up here. So you would say that Cato Parish is, is its relative location is north of DeSoto or um, west of Bozier. Uh, those are its relative locations. So in, in our case, for, for Georgia purposes, we might say that... Um, um, you know, maybe you would just say things like Georgia is north of Florida, um, or you, you might say that uh, Gwinnett County is east of um, Fulton County. Those are the, those are the types of um, um, relative location examples that you would use. Absolute location uses latitude and longitude. We talked about this. So longitude lines are the meridians, so they're drawn from north to south, but what they're doing is measuring how far you are east or west of that meridian. 
Okay, so the prime meridian is at zero degrees longitude, and you're measuring along that line how far east or west of that of the meridian you are. Whereas, um, oh, I'm sorry, and Greenwich, um, England is where the prime meridian is. So sometimes you talk about Greenwich Mean Time. It's related to that that meridian line. Um, latitude goes goes um, the opposite direction. So it's it is running east to west. But it is measuring, it's also known as a parallel, it's measuring north to south of the equator. So the equator is zero degrees latitude. So prime meridian is zero degrees longitude, equator is zero degrees latitude. Um, and so, of course, again, like you're measuring, they run east to west, but they're measuring north to south. All right, so time zones. Time zones are um, used for both business as well as government, um, social purposes even, but it sort of gives a, a standard time. So you know where you are, time zone, versus where you may be communicating with somebody else in another time zone. The international date line goes along this because it is an imaginary line. Please don't imagine it as an actual line you see on the Earth's surface. But it is um, uh, demarcates where one calendar day is one where and, and from the next day and somewhere else on the other side of it. So a traveler crossing the international date line eastbound subtracts one day or 24 hours so that the calendar date to the west is, is repeated. Um, okay, another type of map. We talked about reference maps. Thematic maps. Thematic maps obviously have a theme or one idea to them. So it, um, it usually is connected with a certain area. So for example, this is a chloropleth map, which is actually a different type of map altogether. But the shading may be telling you about certain, either maybe it's a religious um, affiliation or maybe it is the um, types of um, uh, jobs that people hold. It, there's a certain theme about it. Chloropleth uses different colors, chloropleth color, in order to symbolize a range of, of data. And we're actually going to, we are um, uh, going to do a chloropleth map in class to have you give you a sort of an idea of that one. Dot maps, um, usually a dot equals a certain number or quantity. And so dot maps, you can see where there's a large or specific area of a, of a large grouping of that number, whatever it may be. Dot maps are oftentimes used for population, obviously. Um, Isoline maps are kind of interesting. They're, they're, they're basically... Um, giving you, it may be um, sort of like a topographic where you have sort of the elevation that's changing, but the line is going to change based on the data that, that is there. So you actually might have a LISA line map based around um, population as well, but the lines are given different values, and so those lines are going to change based on when the value changes. Mental maps are a big deal, certainly. We use them quite a bit, more than you're probably aware of. Whenever someone says, um, how, do you, how do I get to your house? You are visualizing in your mind basically a map of how to get there. It may not be on a piece of paper. It may be how you travel to your house, but that is still a mental map. And you, so you, you, you gather this from your experiences, from your um, memories, and it's your perception of the space. Um, I oftentimes use this example. A lot of times if you are talking to men or women, um, men will use actual street names and women will give landmarks. So, for example, if I'm telling somebody to go to the Publix down the street, I may say, you're going to um, go past the McDonald's on the right, where someone may say, you're going to pass Seaver Road, somebody else. We're both using mental maps, and we both have our own ideas, but it's our perception of it and what we think of as, a, as being the important piece of information to give. Um, so this mental map shrink, um, actually, I'm sorry, cartograms are... Um, um, showing different data, it, it sort of. Oftentimes, this is used for political maps, for um, like whether you're Democrat or Republican or or Independent, um, and it will it will sort of have your size dependent on the the amount of data. So things that have very little amount are going to be a smaller size than those that have bigger amount. Um, what does this map show you about world population? So again, this is going to be 
um, somewhat of a chloroplast in the fact that it has color, but it's also showing you, based on size, the, the shape of the um, area, okay? So you can tell that, that China and Russia are going to have um, a larger size because they have a larger um, area. Um, India, second um, highest population in the world, large area, even though that's not the shape of India. It's been distorted. But because it has one of the world's largest populations, it looks larger. All right, so some other tools besides just um, types of maps are we're going to talk about GIS versus GPS. These are very different things. They're acronyms, um, or it, actually I think they're initialisms if I remember correctly, but we'll talk about that later. So GIS stands for Geographic Information System. It's a computer system. It's a software, in other words. It organizes and analyzes geographic data. So it, what it will do, will take thematic maps. So you may have one map that is just the soils. You may have another map that is forest. You may have another map that is water. You may have another map that's land ownership. And the GIS system layers those different maps one on top of the other so that you can see all of the data uh, together. And that might be used, oftentimes it's used to decide location theory, the best place to put something, put a location. So um, Urban planners, people that are organizing cities, they may use GIS to decide the best place to put a new Walmart or a new school or um, a new shopping mall. Um, those are, are what we're doing. We need to look at all of the information. Are we going to have to, you know, are there trees there? Are there roads there? Are there, um, um, if it needs to be a farm area, is the soil going to be conducive for that? Those are some things that the GIS systems are used for. So, for example, you may look at this and go, um, that maybe those are islands. You know, those look like maybe little little uh, pieces of landmass in the ocean. But then, when you overlay this on top of it, you can tell that it is something in Louisiana. And then you may overlay the road maps, and you notice that you've got. Maybe it's it's areas along the interstate highways. So you're being you're being able to to look at the full picture through. Even though you may want to look at individual maps, at some point you want to put them all together, and GIS allows you to do that. So imagine that you're a researcher using GIS to determine information. What is a question that you might be able to answer using the technologies available? So think about that. Write one down. Bring it to class. We'll discuss. Besides GIS, there is GPS, very different. You, you're more familiar with this one, I know. So GPS stands for Global Positioning System. And it is going to tell you, using the satellites um, in space, it's going to be able to tell you where on the Earth you are or where on the Earth you want to go. Um, so you're very familiar with this. I'm sure a lot of your parents' cars have GPS systems, or you maybe you're, you have a GPS unit, or your watch can tell you that, your phone. Um, but it's using the satellites to tell where something is. Um, another key vocab term used for geography is remote sensing. This is where you look at an area of the world, um, Let's look at something on the Earth's surface from either aerial photographs or it put, could be satellite images, but you are not there, obviously. So oftentimes this is used after a natural disaster. Um, perhaps you um, want to see the damage that an earthquake had on an area. You could look at satellite images. You could be in Georgia. And you could look at satellite images or... Um, or aerial photographs of the earthquake zone in California and be able to tell the damage that it took. That is remote sensing. So you're sensing something, you're making an analysis of what's happened from a remote location. Um, geographic model, a geographic model. I love that this is Lego pieces being used in the background. A geographic model just is a way to try and explain a pattern that's happening on the Earth. Um, it may be used for future, you know, maybe for preventative um, measures in the future to make sure it doesn't happen again, or it may just be a way to explain why something happens. 
we look at a lot of geographic models, a lot. You will have to memorize the model. You'll have to memorize the theorist who came up with the model. You'll have to understand that the parts or stages of the model. But we'll do a lot of, of work with that. So we're going to stop there. Um, our final part is, is a large, a large section, but is a very important one on the five themes of geography. Um, and we'll go into even more detail with that in class as well. So I hope you've enjoyed it. I will see you next time. Thanks.